So I'm going to be talking about the value of works of literature for educational practice. And I want to cover three things in the, in the time that I've got. I want to talk about the what's, the how's and the why's. So what might we work, learn from, lit, edu, sorry, what might we learn about education from literary works? How might we learn it? And then the why, why bother? Uh, the so what question. I'm going to start by just offering an indication of some different kinds of educational question. Uh, so we might look at, I'm going to try and... Uh, yeah, don't worry. So, for example, we might look at uh, questions like, which way of grouping students most effectively promotes learning? What are the mechanisms of learning? Am I my student's friend? Uh, it was quite common on my PGCE to tell people you're not their friend. Andrew, are you able to mute yourself? Because I, th I think sometimes the because uh, it's picking you up, it doesn't know whether to be looking at me or you. Uh, what are the mechanisms of learning? Uh, is education even possible in schools? I chose a load of different fonts. The one that appears to be boldest here, I didn't intend that, was the why don't I just resign? <laughs> A <laughs> question um, that has come up as most prominent. I don't know whether that's indicative of my of my thinking at the moment. I'm not going to suggest that there is a there's a taxonomy here of different types of question, but I'm going to say there are different questions that we might ask in educational context. Must I love them? Uh, I put there as well. So the inspiration for the approach that I've got to literature and education comes from a very influ influential paper that I read uh, by David Carr called Is Understanding the Professional Knowledge of Teachers a Theory Practice Problem? And he published this in the Journal of Philosophy of Education a good, uh, a good few years ago, 25 years ago. And really, this is, <laughs> this is the question that I've been asking uh, for the whole of my academic career. I think really I'm just a one question type of academic. Um, and it's the same question that Carl, I don't think, um, I don't think it was originally Carl's question, um, but he suggests that students of educational practice may stand to gain far more from a sympathetic reading of Dickens, Orwell and Lawrence in relation to their understanding of education than they're likely to get from studying Skinner, Bruner or Bloom's taxonomy. Now, who goes on what side of that divide is not what's particularly important. Actually, I think Bruner rewards uh, a quite close reading. Um, Skinner, of course, has attempted a fictional account of his approach to education. So who goes on what side? But that general question, um, might we stand to learn not just a great deal from literature, but perhaps more from literature, is the one that I've been uh, I've been interested in. Actually, Andrew and I are doing quite a lot of work on the Newbolt report. Um, and I think there's a suggestion in there in the Newbolt report 100 years ago uh, that there might be pressing questions, not just for English education, but for education uh, more widely, uh, that really um, we need to be looking at literature to address. So the first one, the what, um, I'm going to summarise here maybe three main relevant groups of questions. So there's the firstly, there's the question of what do we want from education? And then of course, when we're talking about education, we're quite often, but not always talking about schooling. So I've got that question as well. Why have schools at all? And then the questions about me as the teacher, why am I doing it? <laughs> am I really cut out to do it? Uh, one of the questions, did I put it on my original screen? Yeah, why don't I just resign as a, as a pressing educational question. When we, when, we, when we see those tensions that emerge between the practice of schooling, the requirements of schooling, perhaps the aims we had uh, when we came into education. And then there's that final question, what does this child need from me right now in this situation? And when I say the need for a literary account of education, I'm suggesting, you know, what, what might that be instead of? Uh, and I might say that might be instead of an account that draws on the educational sciences. So instead of uh, a technical or a technological account of education, because these are not questions that we answer with reference to those with reference to the educational sciences. Um, there's no technical response to that question. What does this child need from me right now 
in this situation? I'm going to suggest that these are normative questions. Now, if they're normative questions, we might say, well, you need to look at philosophy to answer those questions. And I am sort of mo most broadly, I would call myself a philosopher of education. But actually, I think um, that the teacher asking that third question, what does this child need from me right now in this situation, doesn't get a great deal from philosophy actually um, and i'm often resistant of that question you know of that of that attempt to see philosophy of education as a branch of uh, applied philosophy so yes this is an ethical question but it's not a question really which is resolved by going to ethical philosophy what the teacher needs when they're asking that question isn't utilitarianism or kantianism or one of the other uh, ethical philosophies so what does the teacher need so in my <laughs> in my attempt to draw on um literary sources well i'm not i'm, not, I'm looking at a film um and i'm aware that i've got presenters after me who are going to be talking about uh joyce uh, <laughs> and the great literary works so i've brought it right down how how can i get the furthest away from joyce as possible this is love actually of course this is the character mark in love actually uh, I keep wanting to call him Simon because, of course, the actor was 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 in that uh, series Teachers, from which I learned. I actually watched it while I was learning to be a teacher, and I think everything I know about education really can be summed up uh, in what I learned from from Teachers. But in Love, actually, he is Mark, uh, and he ends his. Uh, so he turns up and he he gives this message to the object of his unrequited love who has married his, his best friend. And he ends that, once he's done it, there is a kiss. And then as he leaves, he says to himself, enough, enough now. Now, of course, everybody will have recognized the reference or the allusion to the work of that um, great, popular singer of the Renaissance period, John Dowland, of course. There's a wonderful resonance with Dowland's enough, 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 your joyful looks excels. Um, now, Mark, Mark is sometimes, uh, sometimes thought of as quite a creepy character. There is an interesting, there's a live discussion with Mark about whether this moment is a wonderful moment as he appears at the door and he declares his love, I'll love you till my dying day, and then says to himself, enough. Whether this is a wonderful moment or a really quite creepy moment. What's quite fun, when you look in the Dowland, you can see a similar kind of question. Um, there's obviously that wonderful uh, romantic literary trope of unrequited love, uh, of which Dowland is a fantastic exponent. But there's also a little bit of creepiness potentially going on. So, so sometimes you think, Dowland, maybe you're not getting the message. You know, when he says, shall I strive with words to move when deeds receive not due regard? There's a lot of, shall I strive? Shall I cease to strive? And sometimes you worry, you kind of think, you know, why, why haven't you just got the message? <laughs> you know, you're not wanted. It's time to move on. It's time to say enough. And sometimes Dowland seems to realize this. Treasure is not bought. Favor is not won with words, nor the wish of a thought. This seems to me at one point uh, to be Dowland's recognition. Yes, I, sh I should cease to strive. I should give up. I'm not getting anywhere. Now's the time. To give up and having said that i was going to start off as far away from joyce as i could possibly get there is a wonderful joyce ref, uh, resonance here of course because cease to strive is what stephen daedalus says as he leaves the library in the the odyssey section of ulysses cease to strive and i think there's something there there's something there about teaching the question of um when when should a teacher cease to strive i'm not ready to move on yet I've recently written a paper about love in education. That was one of the, uh, the questions I put up. You know, should I all try to love them, all try to love my students? Am I their friend? And when I was training to teach, we used to say, you know, you're not their friend. You're not their friend. Although, of course, there's a great deal that a teacher can learn uh, about the educational relation from friendship. I've been interested, uh, possibly the philosopher of education who's, in, uh, who's, who's influenced me the most uh, is Porrick Hogan. And in my paper that I wrote about love, I was engaging with Porrick Hogan's idea of education as courtship. 
who wrote a wonderful book, The Custody and Courtship of Experience, where he developed the idea that perhaps what's going on in education is a, is a kind of courtship, or we have something to learn from courtship. Um, and there was some response to that. There was some suggestion that, that, that things would begin to get, to get creepy once he brought in the idea of, of courtship into educational practice. And actually, in his later work, um, Hogan is keen... He moves away from it a bit. He's certainly keen to say, look, if this is a courtship which is to do with love, then we have to be thinking about love as agape rather than love as eros. And he suggests, he says, because if it's love as eros, then, um, then there is the danger that it all gets a bit, a bit creepy. Now, my response to that in my, in my paper that I wrote recently about love is to say, well, I, I don't think you solve the problem by saying this is about educational love is, is about agape rather than eros. Um, so I don't think you solve the problem by saying, because if it was eros, it would get a bit creepy, we should talk about agape instead. Because of course we know that education can get a bit creepy and it can get a bit creepy in that sense that um, the, the, the tactless lover can get a bit creepy, you know, and, and, and there's not really a, there's not really a, 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 me a method or a technical way of, of distinguishing between when I am being persistent in my educational attempts and when my attempts to be who I think what the student wants me to be have become, um, have become gauche. Yeah. Rather, what is needed there is the same kind of capacity that the lover needs. You know, that, that, that there is a point at which our persistence becomes uh, an overly insistent pressing of our suit. Uh, and that there isn't really a there isn't really a clear uh, method for knowing when we have uh, overstepped the mark. So now I'm going to talk about the how. Okay, so if there is if there's something we need to know about education, there might be a relation to literature. Um, how might that work? And I'm going to draw on just two phenomenological insights into teacher knowledge here, uh, and they're both about teacher knowledge. The first one is uh, that the individual teacher always tacitly knows far more than can be made explicit in theory at any particular time. So this is an insight into the limitations of educational theory, of educational research. The teacher always knows far more than can be theorised. But almost hand in hand with that insight is the, recogni the recognition that teachers also do not know what they are doing. Uh, and what I mean by that is we've said that these kinds of questions are normative questions. What does this student need from me right now at this particular time? This is a normative question. It's not a question which is easily informed uh, by, by method, by technical advice. Uh, and that's because what we might say the student needs, well, it, that must be connected to their, to their own most inclinations. It must be collect, connected to who they are. But also, they might not really know who they want to be. And it's part of the job of the teacher, of course, to help them discover who they want to be. But the teacher does not know that in advance. So in education, we have this wonderful situation where both teacher and student are learning in the moment what it is the teacher, uh, the student, sorry, needs to be or wants to be. So that's not something the teacher can know in advance. It's not something that the student can know in advance. Well, what I want to add to that is if we stand to learn from literature, what do we stand to learn from literature? Well, literature isn't going to give us, um, it isn't going to give us any more of that technical guidance. So we don't learn from literature in such a way that we could apply it to our practice. Uh, so if you're looking for take homes from this talk, this is something I often say, there's no take home from this talk. There's nothing that you can go and apply to educational practice. And I think that in the, in the same way, if we say that the practitioner can learn from literature, it's not in the way that there is a take home. This is something incidentally, I think, that moral educators forget. When somebody says that we might learn from literature in relation to morality, I think moral educators often want to find the un unambiguous stories that teach a particular moral message. And that, that's not how we learn from literature. No particular story conveys a particular moral message. So uh, in the same way, sometimes moral educators are worried um, about ambiguous messages in stories or that people might learn in the wrong way from a particular story. This, this story might tell uh, undesired uh, moral messages. And I would say that we, we don't learn from literature in that way, in that there's a, there's a message that we can take, that we can apply to our practice. Rather, I want to say that if literature does anything, it transforms us 
it changes who we are. I like Merleau Ponty's expression that we we are always perched on a pyramid of past life. So that when the teacher um, is making these decisions against this background of educational practice, literature is part of that response to literature is part of what can be forming that ethical sensitivity. But there's no particular work and no particular message that's going to help the teacher there. I've got a colleague who disagrees with me. I've got a colleague working in philosophy of education who's very interested in what we can learn from, uh, from film and from literature. Um, and he thinks that we can learn very particular messages. And one of the examples he gave me um, is that I was watching, he said, I was watching the deer hunter. Uh, and I learned from the deer hunter that you really, really don't want to put a gun to your head and pull the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> and I, almost I want to have a t-shirt there that says, you know, I watched The Deer Hunter and all that I learnt is that you shouldn't put a gun to your head and pull the trigger. Really, I, 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 you know, that, that's what I want to say. If we are going to learn from literature, it's not in that way. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, the why. And my, uh, my quotation there is from Heidegger when Heidegger says, only a God can save us. So I'm suggesting not only that this might be desirable, um, but I'm suggesting that there might be there might be some kind of of danger, some kind of threat uh, that we might actually be responding to by looking to literature for our account of education. And I should I should qualify that hope. I mentioned that Andrew and I uh, have been doing this work on on, on Newbolt, and there's certainly a hope in the Newbolt report a hundred years ago. You know, after the First World War, looking at a, a radically divided society, there's a hope that literature might offer some kind of redemption from an undesirable social situation. And we're 100 years on and we might say, well, what has literature done for us? So, I, I, you know, I'll qualify that claim that maybe this is part of the role that literature can play. But I do want to just think about what that threat might be, what that danger might look like. One of the things I'm interested in is educational technology and its promise of perfectibility. Now, by educational technology, I don't mean particular gadgets. Um, I mean that whole approach to education, which sees it as a, as, as a technical task, which can be perfected. And we might say out there in the educational ether at the moment, there are um, a range of different requirements on education. So there's a quite popular requirement um, that there should be a research methodology that furnishes reproducible educational methods. So you'll see the literature out there, you know, the value of direct instruction for student learning um, as demonstrated through randomised control trials and so on. There's also a desire for a system of assessment uh, that must be reliable. Um, systems of assessment are, of course, uh, in question at the moment. That's quite exciting. Um, and there are lots of concerns about the competence of a teaching body. There's a requirement for a teaching body that must be competent and well prepared. And these concerns out, out there in the ether have led to this, I'm going to suggest, as an answer. You know, what do all these things appear to demand? Well, one of the things that we seem to be arriving at um, is an account of teaching practice as scripted. If you read the book Battle Hymns of the Tiger Teachers, for example, that's produced by the teachers of Michaela School, you will see advocacy of approaches to teaching practice as scripted. Um, so, you know, you use your research methodology to find uh, the appropriate scripts. Um, you render what has been learned in a script so that it can be reproduced across educational contexts. You refine your system of assessment so that it um, accurately assesses adherence to that script. And then you provide that script to your teaching body. And then you even have a system of, assess uh, uh, of inspection, which inspects whether schools are teaching to the script. Even that moves into inspection of higher education. So higher education or inst institutions are assessed on how well uh, they teach that script. Of course, where this is perfectly instantiated is in the introduction of um, the year one phonics check, which replaces what students have learned. It doesn't assess capacity to read with an assessment which tests whether teachers have in fact followed the script. And over the time you can see that the script comes to replace whatever it is we might have um, accepted was questionable in the desirability uh, of that education result. You know, so if education isn't working, it's because you didn't follow the script. Um, and I'm going to offer that as perhaps not simply uh, a threat 
uh, which faces education, but perhaps um, an existential threat. Maybe that kind of uh, perfectibility of technology is the answer to our, to our problems. Um, um, is, is more wide reaching, is more right, wide reaching than simply educational practice. And it may be as Heidegger says, at one point he says only a God can save us, um, but at other points what, what it looks like he's after is some kind of epoch shifting uh, work of art. Um, so maybe he is placing the hope of resistance of this kind of perfection of technology in uh, literature. And I appreciate that uh, I'm out of time now. Should we have to unmute you now, Andrew? Yeah. All right, well, thank, thank you very you. much, David. Um, now is the time when we'd like to open up for any questions that anybody might have. I've got a couple of interesting observations just while I'm... Uh, just while those questions are coming in that people have already put in the chat box. And I don't know if you've got any thoughts about these, David, but one from Brianna, um, who is particularly interested in the idea under uh, lockdown of the idea of what our students need us to be and how um, that might relate to ideas of literature and literary education. I was, I was fascinated to see that one of the books that's done particularly well out of COVID-19 is The Plague by Albert Camus, which apparently has gone through a, you know, an astronomical sale boost um, <laughs> as a result of the current situation. And um, I, I don't know as a, as, as a philosopher whether you've got any thoughts on the idea of what, uh, what our students need us to be and how that can be shaped by certain kind of you know, moral and social crises. Mm -hmm. And well, absolutely. I mean, in a way, I'm more encouraged to discuss that last slide on existential threat precisely because of the, the current situation where we, we, you know, we are prepared to consider those, those, those sort of, you know, much, much broader reaching threats. Um, yeah, the plague, if, if, if I call up um, Netflix or Amazon, um, you'll see that you know, people are watching all of those films, you know, everybody's watching Outbreak, people are watching films about the, the end of the world. And I, I think that's a good, that's a good um, example of what I'm talking about, that these are the times when we, um, you know, these, these films aren't going to, they're not going to teach us anything, they're not going to directly tell us anything that we need. Um, but they are part of our attempt to explore what our meaningful response to this situation should be. Um, and I, I think that that live question of the perfectibility of schooling um, is really exciting at the moment because because we are seeing we are seeing alternatives. You know, there's the, there's the possibility, and I think that's one one of the again one of the things that literature can do is it can say, look, there is there is there is something outside of this perfect process. There are alternatives. Um, now, I, I I offer that with some reservation because it's very easy for me to say well I'm loving homeschool <laughs> but you know this is a, a, a middle class situation where my students are going to be fine and one of the promises we make about schooling is that it will in some way address uh, social inequalities but I think that's that's a that raises a hard question I mean we could look at schooling and and, and say is, is it doing anything um, like that Really. Well, interesting. Roger Dalrymple, who's actually going to speak to us next, has just uh, has just come back on this and and has um, uh, said interestingly that perhaps what um, perhaps what students are are valuing more and needing more than um, than stuff to do with their academic learning is the kind of more pastoral, the softer dimension of moral support, and how they're appreciating the the availability of a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, as as a reassuring presence rather than somebody who's telling them what they ought to know and what they ought to do uh which is uh which is very, very interesting and apposite thank you for that um uh, another observation that we've got uh, two more we'll take one from um shazia who um was quite interested in the idea of the relationship between literature and film and other cultural artifacts now this is a, a conference that's called literature and education um interesting you've talked about film andrew byrne later on is going to be talking about video gaming um ollie bilas is going to be talking about creativity um you know things that imply that literature is far more than shakespeare dickens and thomas hardy um or jane austen uh, and Afra Ben. Um, may maybe you could uh, say what your thoughts are on that, David, quickly. Yeah, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to point to, because obviously the, 
the, the day also links to our book series. I'm going to point people to John Fellon's book, which will be out in a couple of months, all being well, his book on literature and understanding, where one of the things he wants to argue is that we, is that we, can, we can learn from literature. One of the things he says is we, we learn from literature because, um, because literature demands close reading. Um, and he uses that to distinguish literature from other, other forms of popular entertainment. And that's a point where I, I diverge from him slightly. I mean, I, I would say I learnt close reading through my engagement with literature, um, but that there are all kinds of other artefacts of culture um, which, which also yield to a close reading, regardless of whether they were, they were produced in that way. Um, so I'm not suggesting for a moment that Curtis was genuinely <laughs> invoking Dowland at that point in Marx's realisation. Um, but I think, nevertheless, the text yields to that kind of reading. Um, so I, yeah, I'm 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 always keen to 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 to, to also look at uh, film uh, and the more more popular media for the kind of nourishment that I'm talking about. Excellent, thank you. And and one one final question then to you, David. Uh, the, this one from uh, from Philippa um, to say uh, she, uh, she she says I'm wondering if transformation through literature is essentially unreliable. Uh, does that unpredictability need to be considered? Um, yeah, um, so that I mean that's yeah that that's 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 precisely what I would want to 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 introduce here. So that's that's what I see. That's that that that's why I would see that technological approach as an existential threat. You know, I, I following if you like C.S. Lewis in the Abolition of Man or or the, the the story that he tries to tell in that hideous strength. You know, that idea of the perfectibility of human nature is what I see as an existential threat. I wouldn't want to say anything as strong as it's an ex like Heidegger does. Heidegger says something as strong as there are there are worse things than the destruction of all life on earth. Those 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 existential threats are worse than our extinction. I wouldn't want to say that, but I would want to say that sometimes in our concerns about extinction, and we see this at the moment, I'm not questioning the social distancing policy but we see that sometimes measures we might take to prevent extinction actually bring into question um, the very meaningfulness uh, of our existence and so certainly I would want education to remain unpredictable unreliable inefficient because I see a I see a danger in that perfection of the means of delivery Excellent. Well, thank you, David. Really, really interesting start to us. And, and perhaps just as we make the transition, I'm going to, to leave a word to, uh, to, to Bob Eagleston there, what, what, uh, what, what he put out as the thought. Perhaps close reading at base just means paying close attention. Uh, so so let's, uh, let's, let's bear that in mind as, as we go on. So thank you. A really excellent start for us there, David. Very, very interesting.